Well, there's one answer, um, at least if we're looking at it from the long run, regarding what the future of the dollar is. It's simply downward. It's continually downward. Um, if you think that in 1914, a basic middle class car, automobile, the Model T, was $350, an immense suit, a good suit, uh, cost you $20. You can see how far downward the dollar has gone. Today, a uh, Ford Taurus is much, much more than, than $350. It's at least $15,000, which means that the purchasing power of the dollar, at least in terms of autos, has lost 98% of its value. Uh, and in terms of men's suits, uh, around 6%, uh, it, it, it's lost about 94% of its value. Okay. So I'll anticipate my conclusion regarding the long run future of the dollar, unless things change radically. Okay, and we'll talk about the prospects for radical change. But I also want to focus on the short run future of the dollar. Uh, in fact, if uh, we look at the, the news that has been coming out, the, the recent financial news, we're seeing signs that we are really on the precipice of a deep and possibly prolonged recession. Okay, Most commentators, most pundits have missed this because they don't properly define the inflationary process. Okay. Only the Austrian School of Economics really has a theory of, 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 of the correct uh, or, or, or correct theory of what inflation is. Okay. Inflation is not simply a general rise in prices as almost all college professors teach in their introductory college courses. It's much more than that. The fact that prices have not been rising very greatly or very rapidly uh, consumer prices um, from 1991 through 1995 has misled many economists, as we'll see, into thinking that uh, the U.S. economy is going to continue grow, growing okay, without incident. Well, yes, growth has slowed down somewhat, but we will not have a recession. But now we see the, uh, the unemployment rate creeping up. We see uh, the U.S. economy um, having a, uh, experienced a contraction in the number of jobs created in the previous month, 200,000 jobs lost. Uh, and we see the Fed showing the slightest signs of panic now, cutting the discount rate and cutting the Fed's fund rate. Uh, certainly not enough, however, to stave off uh, the coming recession. Which means to me that given that Alan Greenspan comes up for reappointment in March as the chairman of the Federal Reserve System, and like you and I, he wants to keep his job, even though he's a lifelong Republican serving a, a radically liberal a Democratic a president, he still, he still wants to keep that job. Um, it means to me that we may face some, uh, an attempt to, to, to uh, greatly inflate the U.S. economy uh, in the short run. Okay? That, that's, those are the signs. Now, what I want to do then is to focus first on inflation. Okay? I want to tell you some unvarnished truths about inflation that really only the Austrian School of Economics um, continually proclaims. Even the monetarists make grave errors about what inflation is and, and what the consequences of inflation are. And I want to explode some myths, some entrenched and popular myths that are perpetrated by, again, leading economists. And finally, I want to point out that uh, I want, I want to talk, give you a little bit of the details of why I think that we're, 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 we're headed for a, a recession, okay, and, and how a lack of economic knowledge has caused people, has caused economists um, and uh, forecasters and economic journalists to miss the signs of, of the coming recession. Well, let me just start with um, some basic truths about inflation. Okay. Um, in fact, what I want to do is, is, is to tell you what you should know about inflation, which Austrian economists have done again and again, okay. There's a great little book by Henry Hazlitt called What You Should Know About Inflation, uh, which is then uh, republished as uh, The Inflation Crisis and How to Resolve It. Also, these lessons can be learned in a number of books that are being sold here right now. I, I highly recommend Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money and his The Case Against the Fed. And for a solution to inflation, there's his um, uh, The Case for the 100% Gold Dollar, which is being sold. Okay, These are very important works. Uh, they're, they're easily understandable to, to, to the um, educated layman who, who's vitally interested in these questions. Okay, so, I, so I recommend them. Uh, first of all, let me point out the first truth about inflation okay, that everyone should know but, but, but unfortunately doesn't. 
that inflation is caused by, uh, or more correctly, is an increase in the supply of money. Okay, uh, the, 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 the price of money, like the price of any other good, changes when its supply increases. Okay, we know that when the, we had this explosion of high-tech products coming onto the market, okay, that is the increases in, in the amounts of, of personal computers and hand calculators, prices fell precipitously. Okay, despite the, the fact that, that the, 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 the large companies that sold these goods would have liked to keep the prices up, but yet hand calculators fell from in 1970 $350 to 10 and $5 today. And the price of personal computers have come down, okay, from 20000 to $2,000 and less. Okay. Well, the same thing is true of money. The law of supply and demand applies to money. Okay. The less scarce or the more abundant money is made, okay, the lower its price. Only in this case, remember, the price of money is its purchasing power, what it can purchase on the market. So that, uh, for example, when the price of hand calculators came down from 350 to $10 dollars, the price of a dollar increased. In 1970, a dollar could only buy one 350th of a hand calculator. Now it can buy one tenth of a hand calculator. Okay? So as prices fall, the value of money goes up. And of course, the, the uh, obverse is true. Um, as prices go up, the value of, of the dollar depreciates. <coughs> or to put it another way, um, a fall in the price of money is manifested in a rise in all other prices. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, of all the schools of economic thought, the Austrian school has been the most unflinching in its recognition of this truth. Okay. In fact, really the first one to adequately, adequately explain how uh, inflation comes about and how it, 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 it percolates through the economy was Ludwig von Mises in his book in 1912. Okay. He demonstrated irrefutably that every increase in supply of money brings about inflation. And in fact, he used this to actually um, stop, to arrest the uh, Austrian inflation. It was a great Austrian inflation after uh, World War I. And Mises um, went to the, the, the Austrian government, was asked by them as a, as a leading monetary theorist to come up with a, with a solution. Okay, now there's a story about this, which I want to read you, and which I think um, brings home Mises' insight into the quantity of money as the sole cause of inflation. It's not OPEC sheiks that, that cause inflation. It is not greedy unions that cause inflation. It is not temporary shortages in, 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 in harvests. That, none of that, th those things bring about inflation. Okay? To the extent that they raise prices of those particular goods, oil, food, and so on, with the same quantity of money in the economy, you would find other prices falling. So in general, prices wouldn't rise. Okay? when the price of one particular good goes up. It would simply mean that consumers have to reallocate their spending, more money to buying oil, and less money to buying McDonald's hamburgers. Okay. Well, Mises knew all of this. Um, and in 1920, Ludwig von Mises, the world-renowned economist, was called, up, was called upon by the frantic government officials to give his remedy for the ever-worsening Austrian inflation. He agreed to meet with them on one condition, that it was to be at midnight on a certain street corner in Vienna. Although government officials were baffled by his request, they nevertheless agreed. Uh, when they met, it was quiet except for the continuous noise of machinery in an adjacent building. When, official, when officials asked von Mises how to solve their foremost economic problem, he simply pointed to the noisy building and said, first and foremost, you must stop that noise. The building was, of course, the government printing plant. And the sound was the printing of money 24 hours a day. Um, well, that, that, I don't know if that story is true or not, okay, but I've heard it quite uh, enough, and it is, it is something that I, I think Mises would, would say. Um, but in any case, it gets my point across, okay? Nothing but increases in the quantity of money uh, cause inflation, okay? The most notorious instant of, hyper, of, of inflation was, is hyperinflation, okay? If, if inflation is not caught in time, okay, it hives off into hyperinflation, in which people's expectations of prices going up the next day or, or the next hour causes them to spend money even faster. So we get a, a tiger by the tail. In other words, we get a vicious cycle in which expectations of inflation, which is fueled by the government printing new money, brings about an even greater inflation. Now, this, this occurred in uh, Weimar, Germany. Um, let me just uh, give you an idea. Uh, in 1913, um, 
if you compare the price level of 1913 and 1923 at the end of this hyperinflation, uh, prices had risen one trillion times. Okay. So if you had bought a house for um, $100,000 today, if, if something like that, in, in, in two years, it would be $100 trillion. Or actually more than that. Yeah. Hundred thousand trillion dollars. Okay, uh, and of course we hear we hear many of the stories, but but they're true. I mean, people were bringing wheelbarrows full of German marks to market to purchase things like a, a pound of butter. Women brought their laundry baskets full of these notes. Okay, and they were too cumbersome to carry around the store, so they left them out in the front, and, and robbers would run by, dump all the the currency out, and take and take the the, the, uh, the laundry basket. Okay, it was more, worth more than all the. Um, it, this Mises called this the flight into real values. Engineers quit their jobs in factories so they could become taxi drivers and waiters because taxi drivers and waiters got paid every every half hour whenever they served a the customer. So they would run at because prices at the end were rising by hundreds of percent per hour. Prices were tripling, quadrupling per hour. Workers began to be de began to demand to be paid uh, once a week, then every day, then two and three times a day. Their loved ones, their fiancés, their, their wives would wait outside at the factory gates and they would give them their check and they would rush out and spend the money. Okay? In the end, prices became infinitely high, which means that a person wouldn't sell you one egg, for example. A farmer wouldn't sell one egg to a city dweller uh, who, no matter how much currency he, he offered um, the farmer. Okay? And I had, now, how did the government react to this? Uh, typically, stupidly. Um, the government inflation had set off the printing of money had set off the inflation, which in turn generated these inflationary expectations, people expecting prices to go up. So on, on that expectation, they were, they, were, they were spending money even more quickly. And what happened was that now prices began to rise faster than the increase in the money supply because of, of, people's, uh, of people's reactions. Uh, and there was not enough currency. Okay, prices were, because sellers were raising prices to anticipate tomorrow's prices, tomorrow's demands, there wasn't enough currency today. So what, how, what, how did the German government um, solve this? Well, it took over all 2,000 printing plants in Germany, and it began to, and, and, and it took over all stocks of paper, and it began to print day and night. Okay, that that, that part of the story about Mises certainly was true, um, certainly true in Germany. But the, at the end, they couldn't keep up. So what they began to do was simply to recall the notes that they had issued from the banks. So if, if you you had a 1,000 mark note, and I have one here, and I'll pass it around, uh, they simply stamped over it one million marks, which is one billion. Okay, so they're just stamping, they're changing the denominations overnight just by stamping them. Okay, I'll pass that, pass that around at the end. Um, and this is not, this, there is, this occurs in the modern world. Uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in Serbia, the way the, the Serbian government is uh, financing uh, its support of, of, of the Serbs in Bosnia is through inflation, and it's, it's suffering also from an embargo. So it, it, it turns out that the inflation rate has been, uh, for a period last year, 10% daily, prices are rising 10% um, every day, which translates to uh, an annual rate of inflation in the quadrillions. Okay? It now costs to buy a candy bar, a Snickers bar in Serbia, what it cost two years before to buy an automobile. Okay? So it's as if in two years then we'd be paying $20,000 for a Baby Ruth bar. Okay? So inflation is dangerous. It's a tiger held by the tail very precariously. The tiger can break loose at any time and consume the economy. Okay. Fortunately, um, there, were, there was gold circulating in Germany. There, there were dollars circulating in Germany. So the, 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 what Mises called the, and Hans can correct my German, the, the Katastrophenhausen, which is the crack up boom, um, did not occur in Germany, but it would occur in the United States. There are not alternative currencies circulating. We, we would be thrust back into border. Okay, that's, to avoid that, we have to avoid increasing the money supply. It's as simple as that. Okay? Now, let me say something else about uh, another truth, another homey truth about inflation that most economists understand, but they try to soft pedal. And that is, our very banking transactions under our modern banking system are inherently inflationary. Okay? That is, fractional reserve banking is inherently inflationary. There's no other way to put that. There's no appeal from that. Okay? There's no way to say, well, if it's competitive, uh, that's really not the case. They'll, they'll adjust the quantity of money correctly. Incorrect. Wrong. More, fractional reserve banking is inflationary. So that if you were to put $10,000 worth of currency into a, uh, a checking account today, 
In a few days' time, that would be multiplied into a multiple expansion of the money supply. Your bank is only legally obligated to keep 10% of your deposit in its vaults. Actually, it keeps it with, with the Federal Reserve Bank in its district okay, as a reserve. But they can lend out 90% of the currency so deposited, which means then that you have a $10,000 checking account that you can draw on up to $10,000, yet someone else, a borrower, now has 9,000 new dollars that has been loaned out. Now, when that money is spent by the borrower, it's redeposited in another bank. So once again, 90% can be loaned out. So you have the creation of another $8,100. Now, if you took this to its limit, this can be multiplied. Every dollar that you deposit in your, in your checking account can be, can be multiplied approximately 10 times in today's economy. So that $10,000 would result in a few weeks' time in a $100,000 increase in our money supply. Well, actually, a $100,000 increase in checking account money. You would have to subtract the $10,000 of currency from that that you, you originally deposited. Okay. So that's very important to keep in mind. That's the second... Um, oh, and let me just mention also that in mid-January, total checkable deposits in our banking system were um, $733 billion. Okay. Now, how much money was backing that up? In actual reserves? $100 billion. Okay. So in other words, think about it. If everyone decided, which they are legally permitted to do, to, to, to withdraw their currency from their, their, their demand deposits. And by the way, this tends to happen during Christmas, and the Fed scrambles to add more reserves. Um, only out of the $733 billion, people would only be able to, 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 to receive $100 billion, okay? and the whole banking system would collapse. When I was at, at Boston College as an undergraduate in the, in, in the heyday of the student revolution, um, the new left in, uh, up, up in Boston, there was an underground newspaper, and they put out a call for all students. There were 250,000 students in Boston, all college students, to go to the bank the coming Friday. These new leftists were, were some of them were economists, they were new left economists, and to take out all your money from your, your uh, d uh, demand deposits. That would have put the, the, the Boston banks in deep trouble, okay? Um, had it been a call by a, by a libertarian, I may have, uh, I may have gone, but it, since it was a left winger calling for it, I, I would have liked to pull my money up, but I, but I didn't. And not many people did, and, and there was no problem. But, but that is uh, the result of the very nature of fractional reserve banking. Okay, thirdly, it's important to realize that an increase um, of the money supply does not bring about an increase in wealth or human welfare. Okay? Um, in other words, it doesn't add one more item of consumer goods that directly satisfies our want, wants. Um, nor does it add uh, any more capital goods. Okay, by printing up this new money. Okay? In fact, uh, all it does is to bring about a reduction in the purchasing power of money, is, is to raise prices. Okay? Um, and so, so in other words, if we have this dollar, and I were to, to, to tear it up, okay, like, like, there would be no destruction of wealth in our economy. None at all. No one was any worse, is anyone any worse off? I am worse off in my wealth position. Lou promised to reimburse me later. Um, however, note what's happened. I now can make less demand on goods and services in the economy. Their, their number hasn't changed. In effect, this is the essence of the inflationary process or deflation. Wealth has be, been redistributed, not destroyed, redistributed away from me who now has less currency to, toward you. Okay? There's a slight, slight, slight tendency towards a fall in prices. Okay? If I don't, because of that, uh, the subtraction of that dollar from our money supply, I think it was worth the rise, the one dollar. Um, anyway, now, it doesn't make it any, because that dollar doesn't exist, it doesn't make it any more difficult to exchange goods and services. Nothing bad happens to the economy as a result of that. I just, I just perpetrated a monetary deflation in our economy. Okay. I'll come back to that point. Now, let me, let me talk about another, or let me bring up another important point about inflation. Um, this is one of my pet peeves. You continually read in the financial press, okay, and also you hear statements by Alan Greenspan that we have to cool the economy off. We have too much economic activity. There's too much economic growth. Uh, we, uh, we're in jeopardy of, 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 of bringing about or precipitating inflation. We can't grow at 3%. We can only, we have to cool it down at 2%. That's nonsense and it's evil. It's evil because it's saying that scarcity is better for human beings. Okay? That's evil for human beings. We want more economic growth. 
Okay? We don't want to, in other words, if pre people's preferences are such, of course, that they want to save more for the future and bring about economic growth. Um, there's no reason why that economic growth cannot occur on a free market. Okay? In fact, it's really the other way around. Economic growth, because it leads to greater output of goods and services, brings about falling prices. Not the other way around. Okay? Brings about falling prices. We see that in the computer, uh, in the high tech industries. They've grown phenomenally since the mid 70s, since the microchip revolution. And yet prices have fallen. Okay? Prices of, 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 per, of personal computers have fallen from $20,000 to $2,000. I don't see any computer firms. I, I, don't, I, I see a growth in the number of, of computer firms. Uh, now, individual firms have gone out of business, but the more efficient firms have expanded and new firms have come in. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, falling prices, and I'll get to that actually, actually that's my next point. Falling prices does not hinder economic growth. Okay. Nor does economic growth cause inflation. Economic growth brings about, as it did in the 19th century when we were on the gold standard, a gently falling price level. Okay. We've had growth in hand calculators. Prices have fallen. When ballpoint pens were first introduced in 1946, their price was $18, $19. They were first sold at Gimbel's. Um, within two years' time, uh, we had hundreds of, of ballpoint pen companies, and the price was $0.39. Cents. Okay? I, don't, I don't see an inflation of the price of ballpoint pens occurring because of the growth in the industry. That's ridiculous. And the economy is made up of individual industries. So if it doesn't happen in one industry, it ain't going to happen throughout the economy. Okay? Okay, uh, uh, economic growth also, as I said, does not require an expansion of the money supply. In fact, each dollar becomes more powerful as prices fall, okay, as the price of ballpoint pens fell from, let's say, $20 down to 39 cents, those additional ballpoint pens were easily sold because each dollar could buy more ballpoint pens. Okay? The same thing is true with uh, computers. Each dollar has a greater value in terms of computers. So, as we would say in Austrian economics, that as prices fall, the real quantity of money in our economy goes up. Not the number of, of physical dollars, okay, but the amount that each dollar can, can, can purchase. So if we have 5% growth, if there's 5% more goods and services in our economy, we don't have to worry that, well, how are we going to buy this extra 5% of goods and services without extra dollars? In fact, the market will cause prices to fall, as they have, as I said, with, with hand calculators and so on, by about 5%. So each dollar will be worth 5% more. Hence, the entire money supply will be worth, in real terms, 5% more. We'll be able to, to, to afford those new goods, uh, those additional goods and services. Nor does deflation or, or falling prices uh, lead to recession or unemployment. Um, in fact, falling prices result from falling costs. Okay? As technology improves, as we get a greater... Um, Investment in capital goods, which makes labor productivity greater, okay, as it brings about, uh, allow, permits workers to, to produce more. Uh, in fact, what happens is that costs fall. Okay? And as costs fall, there's more competition because there's greater profits. And that's what eventually pushes down prices. In fact, in the computer industry and other industries, costs have fallen faster than prices have fallen. That's why those industries have expanded. So falling prices does not discourage entrepreneurs from investing in that industry. They are interested in the profit margin. The profit margin is simply the gap between the price and the cost of production. If costs fail, fall faster than prices, that gap actually is enlarged and you get more competition. In fact, the greatest rate of growth in the American economy um, in terms of real goods and services occurred in, in the 1880s. Um, we were growing at between 4 and 5 percent per year. Okay, now we're, we're happy if we grow 3% per year. Okay? Uh, and anything over that, everyone starts to worry that we're going to have inflation, so we have to dampen growth. But, but we grew at 5% per year, and prices fell 1% or 2% per year in the 1880s. Okay? You don't need rising prices to have growth. Okay, nor is there a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Um, the so-called Phillips curve... Okay. named after the economist that came up with this alleged trade-off that he, he supposedly found in history, um, is one of the most, Murray Rothbard called one of the most per permicious, pernicious errors in modern economics. Okay, As long as wages and salaries are set at the level at which supply equals demand, there is no, and can be no involuntary unemployment in, the, in, in, in any economy. Okay. Um, recently, Ken Griffey Jr., a star baseball player in Seattle, 
um, received $8.5 million per year. Okay. He wasn't unemployed at that price because he was his, his services were expected to generate at least that additional amount of money for the Seattle Mariners, his team. Okay. However, at some point, regardless of how great a star he is, if he asked for 11 or 12 or 13 million dollars per year, and that exceeded what the owners expected to get in revenue additions from having him on the team, uh, then he would have been unemployed. Okay. There's always a right price. Everybody is employable at some price. Now, it's true that it might, it might uh, be that price is extremely low. Some teenage dro uh, dropouts okay, may have a, uh, you know, uh, what we call a marginal revenue product of $1.50 an hour. Okay. That is, they only produce goods and services worth about $1.50 on the market per hour. But in that case, then, if they were permitted to ask for $1.50, which are not under minimum wage laws, they would not be unemployed. Okay. Or, or, or even on a world level, take Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a barren rock, has no natural resources, its labor force is unskilled compared to the U.S. labor score force. Um, it's not very productive. And yet, everyone there is fully employed. Okay. The reason? Their products are competitively priced on world markets, and so is their labor force. Okay. The reason why American workers, for example, in the steel industry or the auto industry may be unemployed is not because of a lack of of effective demand or aggregate demand, which means a lack of printing up new money. It's not because of that. It's because their their wages are above levels that reflect their productivity. Okay. Uh, moreover, if you inflate, not only do you, you may very well drive down unemployment for a little while. You do that by fooling the workers. Okay. Even Keynes knew this. I mean, Keynes himself, um, in the general theory, revealed that you increase employment when you increase uh, the money supply by driving up the prices of products. So initially the prices of, of goods and services go up, yet wages don't change at first. So profits are higher for firms. So they rush in and hire more workers. So yes, it's true you can reduce unemployment caused by minimum wages and so on by re secretly or, or surreptitiously reducing the, the um, real wages of workers, eroding the purchasing power of their dollars. But when workers catch on, of course, they demand an increase in wage rates, okay, by withholding their labor. And eventually, the unemployment then reappears. Now, I think one of the most important lessons um, that I can teach here is that inflation is not merely a general increase in prices. Okay, it's very important to keep in mind. Um, when this definition is used, it really obscures the outlines of, of, of the inflationary process. Okay, in other words, when the money supply is increased, when the number of dollars in circulation is increased, and I'll give you some, uh, some idea of, of how great this increase has been uh, since we, we, we've had the Fed established. When those number of dollars is increased, it, it causes many other things besides an increase in prices. In fact, many economists um, Talk as if, uh, when, when inflation occurs, all prices go up by the same proportion. So if the government increases the money supply in a given year by 10%, um, many economists, including, for example, Milton Friedman and the monitors, would hold that, well, eventually, in the long run, after a year or two, six months to 18 months, all prices will rise by approximately 10%, the same rate of increase as the increase in the money supply. In fact, that's, that's, that's incorrect, and not only is it incorrect, but it, it really obfuscates the, uh, what's going on, who's benefiting and who's losing from inflation. Okay. Murray Rothbard used to talk about the Angel Gabriel model of inflation. That is that if we all went to sleep um, and woke up the next day and found that our money, uh, let's say our currency in our wallets and our, um, the money in our checking accounts had been doubled miraculously by an angel. Okay. But an angel ignorant of economics. Okay. Hoping to benefit the, the human race, this angel doubles everybody's money supply. Now, we would all rush out and spend that new money. We'd have extra money, right? As if we won the lottery. Okay, a lot of it would be spent on consumer goods, but there's no more consumers goods in the, consumer goods in the economy, so all prices would rise. Okay. Roughly proportionally. Now, that's a good way to teach students that, in fact, uh, an increase in the money supply does not benefit society. But, we have to go deeper than that. In fact, new money is not dropped from helicopters, as, as Milton Friedman's example uh, would lead us to believe, or, or um, brought by an angel. 
Okay, in fact, it's injected into certain segments of sections of the economy. Uh, if, for example, um, the, the U.S. government wants to uh, purchase new missile guidance systems from Silicon Valley, and let's assume they don't want to raise taxes, they want to pay for it by printing up new money. Once that new money is, 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 is spent, now some people in the economy have the new money, others don't. I don't have it sitting in New York at Pace University in my office. So my wages, my salary is not going to go up for a long period of time. The people who get the new money, the stockholders in the firms that sell to the government, and the, uh, the, the highly skilled workers that work in those firms, will have some of the new money, and they'll go out and spend it. Okay? And, and they may spend it on luxury automobiles, the stockholders, and on, on beer, okay, in the case of the workers. Now, suddenly the price of beer and luxury automobiles go up, and people in Detroit and Milwaukee have the new money. Okay? Now, I'm paying more money for beer and for automobiles. Yet, my salary hasn't increased. So there begins an, an, a process of a depreciation or reduction of the purchasing power of my wages. Money or, or real income is being transferred from me and others in, in that situation to the people who have gotten the new money first. Okay. And of course, the people in Detroit, workers in breweries, uh, in Milwaukee and, and, and auto workers, now begin to spend that new money and drive up other prices. The prices of, uh, of uh, trips to Disneyland, uh, Disney World uh, and the prices of of, let's say, McDonald's hamburgers and so on. So prices go up step by step, and as the other side of that process, the real wages of the people who have not gotten that new money initially go down. Now, ultimately, most people will get that new money. Eventually, people will, will, will buy financial services from New York City. They'll increase their purchase of financial services maybe a year down the road, uh, in which case um, people, people in financial firms will get paid more, and they'll go into MBA programs. I teach in an MBA program at Pace University. And they'll, the tuition will go up at Pace. And maybe two years down the road, my salary will finally go up. But in those two years, during which prices throughout the economy have increased and my wage rate or salary is not kept up, real wealth has been redistributed from me to others in the economy. And you have to pity, of course, the people on fixed incomes. Okay, People living on, on um, pensions, uh, in, in insurance payments, and so on. Uh, these people never get that new money, which means that they take permanent cuts in their real incomes. So, what happens is that the people, these people, who, who might spend money on oatmeal and Florida vacations, okay, we find that their demands relatively for those things don't go up as much. So the prices of oatmeal and, and Florida vacations, or Florida condos, if they buy condos to retire in Florida, those prices may go up very little or not at all, whereas other prices go up by a great deal, luxury automobiles and so on. So the first lesson is that prices do not increase proportionally. Okay. Um, the other point we want to make very quickly is that uh, the way this new money is injected into the economy in today's world is through the fractional reserve banking system. The government, in effect, creates new reserves out of thin air. Okay? In 1971, or actually, actually in 1990, reserves in our banking system were $75 billion. That was the amount of reserves. Um, just a few days ago, the reserves were up to $100 billion. The government injected, over the course of the last five years, $25 billion new dollars into the banking system. Now, remember, when that's loaned out, that's multiplied about tenfold. So it brought about, in the last five years, um, a massive increase of the money supply. But in doing so, in relentlessly injecting that new money day after day, uh, up until 1993, we'll, we'll talk about what has happened in the last two years, it pushed down interest rates. Now, what did that do? That caused businesses to borrow more so they could buy more capital goods. So some of these other effects of inflation we begin to see, a drop in interest rates, a run-up in the stock market, okay, which is caused by lower interest rates. If corporate earnings don't change, in fact, corporate earnings are going up because there's more money being spent on capital goods, on the one hand. On the other hand, they're discounting those earnings at a lower interest rate. So we see a stock market boom come about as a result of inflation. Also a real estate boom as industrial prices of industrial and commercial real estate go up. Okay? Also, at least up until 1995, as the U.S. dollar loses its purchasing power because of this inflation, in domestic terms, we begin to get a fall in the exchange rate. The U.S. dollar loses value on the foreign exchange markets. So all of these effects occur and are ignored when we define inflation as simply a rise in consumer prices. Okay? Now, let me... This, it's, it's this misdefinition of inflation that has brought us, that has misled 
economists uh, on three different occasions misled them seriously in, 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 into uh, denying that the U.S. economy um, would experience uh, a recession. Okay. It occurred in the 1920s. Okay. In the 1920s, even though the economy, or even though the, uh, the, the Fed, increased the money supply at a fairly rapid rate, and if you look at Murray's book, um, America's Great Depression, which I recommend, um, he sets that rate at about 7% per year, consumer prices didn't go up. The CPI didn't go up. In fact, prices fell slightly from 1921 to 1928. So most economists, most American economists, led by Irving Fisher, who was um, Milton Friedman's mentor, claimed that the era of perpetual prosperity was at hand. Our economy was growing tremendously, and yet prices were, were, were level. There, is no, there was no inflation. Okay? So we would never have another depression. The U.S. economy was depression-proof. Okay. Now, Austrian economists, led by, by Friedrich Hayek, and also um, including von Mises, uh, looked around and said, wait a minute. The Federal Reserve is rapidly increasing the money supply. Regardless of whether or not consumer prices are going up, and they had not been because of the tremendous increases in technology and productivity in the 20s, whether or not those prices are going up, the, sa the same effects are occurring on interest rates. Interest rates are being pushed down. They're being distorted. On investment, we had an investment boom in the late 1920s. We had a real estate boom in the late 1920s. As a result, we had a massive distortion of the structure of production. Our entrepreneurs were fooled by the low interest rate into producing too many capital goods and not enough consumer goods. When the inflation stopped in 1928, we quickly got the Great Depression hitting us in October of 29. Um, and that was predicted by Austrian economists who, who take a much fuller and richer view of what the inflationary process is. Okay? Inflation distorted relative prices, not just, didn't change overall prices. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, it's relevant to what's to what's happening today, okay? The so-called Reagan recovery, okay, the Reagan prosperity of the 1980s, okay, that seemed to be very great and to go on for a long period of time, at least from 1982 through, through 1987 when we had a stock market crash, but then it picked up again and went from 1988 to, to 1990. That was not done with, uh, via, uh, or because of, of tax cuts. The tax cuts that were that the Reagan administration implemented in the early 80s were piddling tax cuts. They were tiny, and they were they, they were they, they were um, reversed pretty much by increases in, in in social security taxes and so on. That was not what caused the seeming um, prosperity. Okay. What caused it was a massive increase in the money supply. Okay, that occurred um, from 1982 until 1986. Okay. That was perpetrated by the Fed. A Fed, a Fed that wanted to get uh, President Reagan reelected. That is, a Fed that wanted to give the incumbent president a monetary policy that would get him, him reelected. And in fact, just to give you an idea of the uh, dimensions of that inflation, from an Austrian point of view, uh, let me just point out that from 1983 through 86, the money supply increased by 17% per year. The Fed increased the money supply by hundreds of billions of dollars, printing up new money, in effect, out of thin air. Okay. Um, we also found that the interest rates were pushed down by the Fed. Okay. For example, from uh, the commercial paper rate was eight and three quarters percent uh, on March 15, 1985. Two years later, it was it had fallen to 6.29 percent, or about two and a half percent. Okay. Um, corporate bonds fell from, from 12.6%. They fell by 4% down to 8%. That set off an investment boom. The prime rate was driven down from 10.5 to 8%. But economists missed all this. And so did the commentators. Okay? Why? Because consumer prices rose very little during that time, by 2 or 3% per year. Okay? So everyone is telling us that, well, it looks like, again, we've banished recessions. Okay? The economy's in for a soft landing. Now, once economists begin talking like that, we are in for a major recession. Okay? And they're starting to talk like that again. Um, the, the stock market from 1982 to 87 increased by 214%, tripled in value, the stock, stock market. And the U.S. Um, versus the yen, the U.S. dollar lost about 77% of its value against the yen, or the price of the yen went up by 77%. Okay. In any case, what happened, the, the, US, the Fed began to be frightened by what was occurring with, with the dollar losing its value in 1986. It slammed on the monetary break, breaks. It stopped increasing the money supply for a few months. 
And then by October, we had the stock market crash. Okay, Interest rates shot up, um, prices of capital goods fell, and we had the stock market crashing. Now, I want to toot my own horn here for a moment. I was the only one that I know that uh, predicted this, this... Well, actually, after the crash then, the government were, was fearful that the whole financial system would collapse. So they, be, they began to, to inject new money into the economy again in 88 and uh, 89. And that postponed the recession for a while. So then economists began to, to, to feel good again. They began to say, well, you know, generally when we have a recession... Um, we have uh, re, uh, generally when we have a stock market crash, we have a recession six months later. That hasn't happened. So the, the stock market crash was you know, a speculative bubble or something. It, it really has no bearing on, on real economic activity. And that's when we began to get talk of a soft landing. Now, of course, we had a, a very deep and grinding recession in 1990 through, through 1991. It actually, I think, carried on longer, and it was responsible for Bush losing the election. Okay, but. Um, I had written an article in, 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 in 1988 in which I went against the, uh, the consensus, based on Austrian theory. Let me just read you the conclusion of this. It, it appeared in the Baltimore Business Review. Um, this is when everyone was, 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 was denying that a recession was anywhere in sight, September of 88. I wrote, um, based on Austrian cycle theory, my summary outlook for the U.S. economy for the next year, therefore, includes accelerating price inflation, coincide, coinciding with uh, rising interest rates and a declining dollar during the first two or three quarters of 1989. While these trends of interest rates and exchange rates may be temporarily interrupted by well-publicized and coordinated attempts by the U.S. and foreign governments to support the dollar on currency markets, the Fed will be compelled to substantially tighten monetary policy before the end of the year. This will usher in a recession in late 1989 or early 1990. Okay. It occurred in, in mid-1990, which should strike the U.S. economy with a particularly heavy impact on the thrift and banking in industries, and we, and we got that. Okay. Now, that, uh, an Austrian economist would deny that you, could, you can predict the timing, and, and I, I hold to that. Okay. I still did. But um, the key is that we know the broad trends. The theory allows us to predict that when there's been a massive increase in the money supply, there will, in fact, at some point, which cannot be avoided, can be postponed, but not avoided. At some point, there will be a recession. Okay, and this is what's occurring now in the 1990s. Okay. Uh, let me just give you some figures again to show, re reveal to you the uh, dimensions of the inflation that we've had to get us out of out of out of the recession, um, and to save Bush's job, we began to, to get an inflation in 1991. Uh, let me give you an idea of, of how much money was created. Um, in the last quarter of 1990, or actually at the beginning of 1991, the money supply, as I would define it, and Murray Rothbard also has a true money supply, um, stood at about $2 trillion. Just about $2 trillion. Okay. Uh, three years later, it stood at $2,671,000,000,000. In other words, in three years, the Fed created $674 billion new dollars. Okay. Uh, and that's, uh, they increase the money supply by 33% or 11% per year, which is a very rapid rate. If you take a more conventional definition of the money supply, M1, um, the rate was 36% or 12% per year, okay? The Fed, in this case, uh, increased the money supply by um, approximately um, $300 billion, okay? Now, what happened? Interest rates, at the end of 1990, the Fed funds rate rate was 8.25. By 1994, the first first month, January, it was down to 3%. It was put, it, short term interest rates were pushed down precipitously. Um, commercial paper rates fell from almost 8% to to 3.2%. Okay, so a boom was was set off here. Now it was not manifested in rising prices. One of the reasons is that Japan and Western Europe were still in recession. So the demand for, for, for commodities w wasn't very great. So the consumer, the CPI rose only by 4% in 1991, 3% in 92, 3% in 93, and in the last two years by 2.9% or so, um, which led economists to believe that the inflation, inflationary dragon had been, had been slain okay, by, by the Fed. Um, but yet we had an investment boom. Okay? Investment has been increasing from 91 through 95 by about 12% per year. Okay? Uh, and the Dow Jones um, shot up in 92, uh, 93. Then it paused more or less in uh, 94. Um, didn't go up or down. And then it's, it's begun to take off again. Okay, it's been it's up 40 percent in the last year. Um, 
I submit, however, that this is all now about to come to an end. I think the Fed realizes this. They, uh, they, they, they think now that we're on, you know, we're on the verge of a recession. Um, remember, the Fed does not want pressure from from an incumbent president. Um, if, if it doesn't give in and, and, and try to inflate us out of this impending recession, what you're going to find happening is that very bitter Democrats in Congress will begin threatening to take away the independence of the Fed. That's exactly what happened in 1992 when George Bush was on his way to defeat. Okay, the Republicans in the Congress w went about saying things like, "Well, Congress created the Fed. Congress can abolish the Fed, or, 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 or can, uh, can, can can change the Act so that the Fed is more responsive to Congress." Plus, as I mentioned before, Alan Greenspan is coming up for re-election. So what I see then is, is is more inflation. Okay, however, the inflation may be too little and too late, and we may still get uh, a recession in the election year. In which case, Clinton would really be doomed have been undertaken in the last five years to occur quickly, okay, to get that out of the way. Okay? Uh, certainly that, that leads to a healthier economy. It also, again, uh, would lead, I think, to a better political regime, okay, if Clinton lost as a result or, or it helped him lose, that is, the, the, the recession. Okay. Um, one last point I want to make, and then I'll take some questions, and that is one of the most nonsensical statements that is made in the press, in the financial press, is that the Fed is an inflation fighter, okay? The Fed is the only institution legally permitted to create new money. The Fed is the cause of inflation. It doesn't fight inflation. That's ridiculous. In fact, if we just take a broad view, um, if we look at, at, at one of the, uh, the conventional figures uh, the, the, for the money supply, M1, we had $26 billion dollars in our money supply, 26 billion in 1929. Okay, at the end of 1995, M1 stood at 1 trillion 124 dollars, uh, 1 trillion 124 billion dollars. Okay, that's a massive, massive increase. Where did that money come from? If not from the Fed, certainly it came from the Fed. Okay, and that certainly has driven up prices from 1929 to today. Even since 1971, when President Nixon cut the last vestige of the gold standard, okay, or remove the last vestige of the gold standard by closing the, the window, not allowing foreign governments and central banks to convert their dollars for gold. Okay. Since that point, the, uh, the Fed has um, created 896 billion new dollars. The money supply has increased from that, um, from relatively recent past, 24 years ago, by 393%. In other words, it's quintupled. The money supply is quintupled in 24 years. Now compare that to the 19th century, to the gold standard. We had a very slow increase in gold. And in fact, the increase in the output of, of goods and services outstripped the increase in gold so that prices in 1896 were lower than prices in 1834, the year the United States went on, on a gold standard. By 1913, prices were just about what they were in, in 1834. And people called the period from 1896 to 1914, when the Fed was established, a great inflation. Now, you know why they did that? They called it that because we had an inflation rate of 13% over 18 years. Prices went up by less than 1% per year, and for people who were used to the gold standard, this was a massive inflation. Okay, now we have, in the, in the U.S., certainly in, in the early 80s during the Carter administration, we had 16, 17% per year. Okay, never mind over 18 years. So now when we're down to 3% per year, people are saying we've defeated inflation. Okay. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll conclude by pointing out that really the only school of thought that consistently propounds the truth about inflation is the Austrian school. Okay, And the Austrian school is very, very tied to the Mises Institute in that the Mises Institute gives Austrian scholars the wherewithal um, to pursue research into this important topic. We all of us face right now the specter of the comeback of Keynesian economics on, on the world level. Now, what they've been looking for since the early 1940s is a world money, a one world money. With a world money, there would be no barriers left against hyperinflation. So uh, what I would urge you to do is, 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 is to begin to, to, to you know, read the works of the Austrian school, um, spread the word among all your colleagues and friends, and um,
Well, I'm going to just outline there and take questions. Yeah. Okay, you have to keep in mind that, that uh, prices are determined both by the supply of and the demand for money. Occasionally, the demand for money will go up. People want to hold more money. So even if there's new money coming into the economy, people will hold more maybe because uh, of, of expectations about future falls in prices. Also, if the supply of goods and services increase, remember, and we talked about that, uh, as, they, as they continually do in a free market economy, you're going to get new money coming into the economy being met by increases of supplies of goods and services. Okay? So that's why you can't assume that um, because we don't see prices rising over any given period, there is no inflation. You must look at the money supply figures. Yes? Right. That's a good point. Yes. Yes. Uh, so by concentrating only on part of the products, the impression is generated that there is right. not much going on in terms of inflation. If you take all the mm -hmm. into consideration of cost of inflation, yeah, it, it, uh, if, I, if I, I try to get across any lesson, it's that inflation is a multi-dimensional process. We, we've had a massive inflation in, in the stock market in the last five years. Yes. No, you're right. Um, Eighty percent of the U.S. money supply is in the form of checking account money. Okay. Now, most of those reserves I was talking about that actually backs up your checking account is really not in, in the vaults at all. Okay. Most of the money, uh, most of the reserves are really just entries in the Fed's computer. Okay. And when the Fed creates new reserves, for example, let's say your bank wants a loan. Okay, for whatever reason. Well, let's say your bank wants a, uh, goes to the Fed and asks for a $50 million loan. Um, well, they get the loan, and they lend that $50 million out, and then that can be multiplied 10 times. Now, where does the loan come from? All the Fed does is, is go into the computer, find your, the T account for your particular bank, and just type in plus $50 million. And then it calls up your bank at the end of the day and says, you can now loan out $50 million more. That's, that's the way it's done. Uh, also, by the way, 70% of U.S. currency, by some accounts, is not in the United States. It's, it's financing underground economy transactions, including drug transactions throughout the world. Yes? Well, mm -hmm. right. Well, no, if you pay your bank loan back, then uh, the bank has those reserves to loan out to someone else. So unless the Fed destroys those reserves, and they can do that, and they do that too. They can just take it out of the computer. Then your, your bank has to call in loans, and the whole money supply decreases. Now, that's been happening in the last two years. I didn't mention, I meant to mention it, that the money supply has actually decreased slightly in the last two years. So that's what, why I think the prospects for a recession fairly soon are good. Okay. Yes? No, because a money money market um, money market mutual fund you're talking about a money market mutual fund is really simply uh, a, a share. It's not a deposit in a sense that depositing money in your bank is. What the money market fund does is simply invest the money for you in a portfolio of assets. Money markets cannot create money. That's why I, I object to some of the uh, money supply figures like M2 because they include money market mutual funds. Okay. All it is is if you write out a check on a money market fund, it's, it's simply like writing a note to your broker telling him to sell certain stock and se send a check to you or to someone else that you name in the, in the note. Okay, That's what the money market mutual fund does. It's, in order to pay you back, they have to sell some of, of the certificates of deposits, some of the commercial paper that they own. 
And when you write out a check, you're just telling them to take the proceeds of that sale and, and send it to someone else. So they're good guys. They're not fractional reserve banks. In fact, I've argued that that um, it, on, on a totally free market, fractional reserve bank would collapse, okay? And you, you get these types of institutions as ways that people can have quick access to their money yet still earn interest. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wait, you're saying if, if we have some sort of stagflationary inflationary recession. Oh, and I had $100,000. Yeah. And you see, it's tough. Inflation, you know, if it's rapid enough, you might want to hedge by going into gold. But, but inflationary recession... Maybe consumer goods um, companies, they don't do terribly in recessions, like Sears and Kmart and so on. They do all right during a recession compared to uh, Bethlehem Steel. So you want to stay away from, in a recession, you want to stay away from the capital goods industries. You want to stay away from mining stocks, you want to stay away from uh, steel and so on. Right? I mean, I, I, I you know, wouldn't pick, pick you know, particular companies, but uh, outside, yeah, it's, it's tough. You see, with, with inflation, you, you get two, two things going at once. Yeah, but then you have to be careful. I mean, yeah, I mean, it might, it, it, yeah, the Swiss franc is probably a harder currency now than the U.S. dollar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any more, or that's it? Okay, thank you. Thanks.